Hi and welcome everyone. We are ready to start. My name is Rasmus Kolbo and on behalf of Hans Christian Andersen Capital, I have the pleasure of welcoming CFO Martin Balstel from No One, who will take us through the uh, latest Q2 numbers, uh, the report that was published earlier this week. So a uh, warm welcome to you, Martin. Thank you very much. And before I hand over to you, I'd also like to give a warm welcome to all of those who signed up for today's presentation. As usual, you can ask questions in the uh, chat, in the uh, right lower corner, and you're welcome to do that in Danish if you're more comfortable with that. Um, and of course, we record the presentation here and we'll publish it afterwards on different platforms. But with that, I'll leave it to you, Martin. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Rasmus. Um, and uh, thank you all to the uh, audience uh, for, for joining. Uh, as, uh, as Rasmus said, my name is Martin Bersel and I'm the uh, CFO of uh, DS Norden. Uh, which is a great place to be at the moment. And I'm happy to uh, present our figures and latest development for you following a quarter where I must say practically everything uh, went right. The agenda for today uh, is first a, a brief uh, highlight of the uh, second quarter, uh, a deep dive into our two business units and their performance. And then, uh, of course, we will turn to the market development and the outlook of where we see the, our two main markets uh, heading. Uh, before we uh, close with some final words. So let's uh, jump right into it. Uh, in general, we had a fantastic quarter uh, in the second quarter. We made a net profit of $179 million, and you will see the strong positive development in the graph on the left. Uh, and actually, for me, it's not just the result, but really the key thing for me uh, in the quarter was this significant shift that we were able to do in changing our market exposure from being predominantly exposed to a strong dry cargo market to now being predominantly exposed to a very strong product tanker market while reducing our exposure uh, to a dry cargo. I'll get back to the details of that in, in just a few slides. In the beginning of uh, August, uh, we upgraded our full year guidance so that we now expect between 560 to 640 million dollars, making this uh, truly a record breaking year. Uh, based on that uh, stellar performance and our very strong cash position at the moment, uh, we decided together with the board to uh, pay out an interim dividend of uh, 30 kroners per share and also launch a, a new share buyback in addition to the ones we have already done this year. And the new one will be $40 million. Uh, and that's these two things combined is actually close to $200 million payout uh, to our shareholders. Briefly, in our two business units, the assets and uh, logistics part, uh, the main story here is really that uh, the improvement in product tanker rates and product tanker values uh, led to an increase in the net asset value for this business unit of 100 kroners per share, taking it to around 377 kroners per share at the end of June. We saw strong earnings in dry cargo, and importantly, because the market is actually showing some weakness, we have fully covered our position uh, for 2022 and also actually 2023. In the uh, freight services and trading uh, business unit, we made a profit of $153 million, which was really driven by record margins uh, from the high and volatile MR rates, but also a good short position in dry cargo, where we had actually taken on more cargo than we had ship capacity. And because the market has since declined, we can now take in ship capacity to service those cargoes uh, and secure a strong margin. <clears throat> and importantly, on top of the 377 per share that I talked about for assets and logistics, we have also built up substantial value in the freight services and uh, trading business unit. The graph here shows you the development uh, between the relative exposure that we have had since April between our exposure to product tanker markets and dry cargo markets. And you will see in the beginning of the graph here, we were predominantly weighted towards uh, a strong dry cargo market with close to 60% exposure and the rest, the 40% being in product tankers. Uh, and we also said in connection with our Q1 that we had started to change our exposure uh, because we felt that the weakness was ahead on the on the dry cargo side, whereas we saw more uh, upside on the tanker side. And you can see the effect of this here, where we are actually now around 70% exposed to the product tanker market and only 30% to uh, the dry cargo market. Uh, and I think the uh, a key thing to notice here is 
that we are actually running close to 500 ships and still within a matter of months, the model that we have built up over the last couple of years actually enables us to really make big changes to our exposure in a fairly short uh, period of time. Uh, and of course, this means that uh, the weakening dry carbon market is not very hurtful uh, to our overall portfolio uh, because we have uh, covered a lot of it, whereas we benefit fully from the attractive risk reward that we see uh, on the product tanker side. <clears throat> We continue uh, our policy of uh, paying out most of uh, our earnings to, uh, to shareholders, which is really an effect of the business model that uh, we have developed, uh, where we can be very asset light and actually still participate uh, in the market. You will see here since 2020 and including 2022 year to date, that we are almost paying out uh, fully uh, what we are earning. Half of it or a little bit more than half is in the form of dividends. And then we top off uh, with uh, share buybacks, which is a little bit more flexible and can be uh, initiated when we think uh, the, uh, the time is, uh, is right for that. And these share buyback programs, we have actually run over a number of years. Uh, and uh, you will actually notice that slowly and gradually we are uh, reducing the net share count. Uh, it is down by 9% since 2020. And we really feel that these share buybacks is accretive uh, to our earnings per share. Um, uh, development uh, through this measure. Looking a little bit into our two business units, <clears throat> assets and logistics to start with, uh, you see here on the graph the development in the net asset value per share for this part of the business, which increased uh, almost 100 kroners uh, during the, uh, the last quarter uh, to end at 377 kroners at the end of June. <clears throat> Uh, we have secured a lot of cover uh, in dry cargo, which basically means that the capacity we have on our books has been rented out, some of it to our freight services and trading unit and some to other uh, entities, uh, to our customers, which basically means that uh, we have very little exposure to the dry cargo market in the next sort of uh, 18 months. Uh, we have done that by TCing out uh, vessels, but also by selling vessels, and we did uh, actually, three more vessel sales uh, in the in the quarter, which will hit uh, our earnings, or which will benefit our earnings uh, in the second half of the year. On the uh, on the tanker side, <clears throat> we have taken in one more tanker in addition to the ones we took on uh, late last year and earlier in the year. But we have also started to secure some uh, some value by leasing out uh, three MRs at three year time charter uh, at fixed rates so that we sort of put a good, uh, robust uh, earnings into our book for the year, for the next couple of years. Um, at the bottom, you see how the 377 kroner per share in this asset value uh, is, uh, is composed, where out of the $1.9 billion of NAV, the $1.4 billion is the value of our own fleet and our long-term time charter fleet. And then, of course, uh, a big uh, cash position uh, on top of that. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, I think is a fantastic development uh, within just the span of, uh, of three months. One thing that uh, we often feel is perhaps a little bit neglected in our portfolio is the uh, attractive optionality that we have. So typically when we make long-term leases, we have uh, options to extend the lease. So it could be a five-year contract where we can extend year six, seven and eight. And typically, uh, we also get a purchase option uh, that could either start in year three or maybe in year five. Uh, and uh, this basically uh, allows us to take on uh, the cover that I talked about before for the firm part of the lease and actually then still have upside if, we, if the market uh, develops more favorably than, uh, than expected. Uh, and I think this really allows us um, the, uh, the courage, you can say, and the confidence to make the decisions that we did during this quarter of reducing our exposure in dry cargo, because we still sit on a lot of these options. Uh, and you can see from the two graphs here, uh, where we have put in the lines showing where the MR rates and the uh, supermax uh, rates are, combined with on the right-hand side where the five-year-old vessel prices are. And you will actually see that the current prices, to a large extent, actually are above uh, where these uh, purchase and extension options can uh, be declared. 
so some of them cannot be declared right now, uh, but there is actually a good likelihood that uh, when they become declarable, uh, there will be some uh, positive uh, profits to be made there. In the asset light business unit that we call freight services and uh, trading, uh, we made $153 million. Uh, and here also, we made a significant uh, shift in our exposure away from dry cargo over to product tankers. And here it was actually, you can say, extreme enough that uh, we went outright short uh, in dry cargo, basically meaning that uh, we had more cargo uh, commitments than we actually had vessel commitments, so that we benefit from the decline in the market. <clears throat> Uh, and that was, of course, uh, according to uh, our general uh, game plan. Uh, and of course, it played out uh, almost exactly uh, as, uh, as we had hoped. And that means that we do have also here substantial market value built up in our contracts that will benefit earnings in the next six months and also through uh, 2023. <clears throat> the way we look at the valuation uh, of, uh, of the company uh, is uh, in two different columns, if you will. So on the left-hand side, we have the assets and logistics business unit. On the right-hand side, the freight services and trading. And we at least believe that they should be evaluated in different ways. So on the left-hand side, this is where all our assets are and our long-term leases. And here it makes sense to, uh, to continuously assess what are the values uh, of the contract portfolio that we have, including loans and cash and so forth. And this is where we end up at the 377 kroners per share at the end of June. Whereas on the right hand side in freight services and trading, we think an earnings based valuation is more appropriate. Uh, and here we will say uh, the exercise would be to figure out what is sort of the long term normalized level of earnings for this business unit and then apply uh, either a discounted cash flow model to that uh, or an uh, earnings multiple. And uh, to, uh, to make some inspiration, we have uh, put in the earnings over the last uh, couple of years and quarters. And you will see from the bottom part here that the average earnings over the last three years from 2019 to year to date today is $152 million uh, in net result. Whereas if you exclude the first half of this year, which you may consider to be a little bit extreme, uh, and $100 million is the average net result for the period 19 to 21. Uh, and if you apply uh, an, uh, an earnings multiple, it could be either five or 10 or whatever you prefer. Uh, there's actually some decent value here that should be put on top of the 377 uh, on the left hand side. Turning to the uh, markets, I think the graph at the bottom left here indicates uh, quite precisely actually what happened. So the red line is the one-year TC rate for Supermax and the blue line is the one-year rate for, for MR tankers. <clears throat> and you will see that uh, following actually uh, a pretty strong <clears throat> end to Q1 and start of Q2, there was a clear decline in, uh, in rates during the uh, second quarter and during the summer period. Uh, and the blue line on the opposite indicates that the uh, tanker market following uh, gradual improvement uh, towards the end of Q1 saw a real explosion actually <clears throat> during the second quarter, where uh, the spot rates, which is even more extreme than this, actually tripled from $12,500 a day to around $42,000 a day <clears throat> within MRs. Our view on the dry cargo market is, uh, first of all, uh, that there's actually a lot of uncertainty. You have some big factors that are very hard to predict. So you have a quite weak development in China uh, you have some very uncertain uh, volumes on grain due to the war in, uh, in Ukraine. And of course, uh, you have the whole um, central bank interest rate increases that may actually lead to lower economic growth, uh, especially in Europe, but certainly also elsewhere in the world. So we do see, um, uh, we do see continued weakness in dry cargo driven by lower volume growth, uh, but uh, supporting the market to some extent uh, will be that we see longer distances and uh, we do think that seasonality wise where Q4 is typically a strong part of the year, you could see some improvement in spot rates. But overall, as we come into 2023, we think the weakness in the dry cargo market uh, will persist. Looking a little bit further ahead, we are actually uh, also of the opinion that uh, the downturn that we are seeing here is likely to be fairly short and shallow. Uh, 
uh, not least because the uh, order book, as you will see indicated in the graph at the right hand side, is actually historically low. Uh, very few ships have been contracted during this uh, boom that we have had over the last 12, 18 months. And this means that the normal part of the dry cargo downturn, which is supply growth, is actually not very intimidating. Uh, and uh, we actually believe that once the world economy is uh, uh, going back into a growth mode, there is a uh, good reason to believe uh, that the low order book uh, will actually then facilitate uh, renewed strength in dry cargo. But that is a little bit down the road. In tankers, on the other hand, we foresee uh, high spot rates uh, and we expect them to continue for the rest of this year and well into 2023. We have uh, for a long time had a situation where oil stocks have been quite low, oil prices have been increasing, which puts a damper on demand. <clears throat> uh, but the uh, effect of uh, self-sanctioning and inefficiencies in the market is really that uh, vessels have longer to sail and they have more idle time, more ballast time. And uh, this basically elevates uh, the need for ships to transport the volumes of oil uh, that uh, the market needs. Um, so uh, we think this will be a good support uh, to, uh, to spot rates. Also a counter to the lower oil demand from higher prices is really that the oil prices are actually still quite cheap on an energy level compared to both coal and gas. Uh, so the high gas prices and high coal prices are basically incentivizing use of oil, uh, perhaps as a, uh, an energy source in refineries and the petrochemical industry. So we think there will be some support to uh, demand from that front as well. <clears throat> uh, also here, the order book, as you can see on the right hand side, is at a very low level. No one has ordered uh, uh, product tankers or crew tankers for that matter in, uh, in recent quarters. And this also here means that any demand strength, I think, will to a large degree be converted into uh, spot market strength. <clears throat> there is an interesting um, uh, upside scenario here uh, also, actually, which really is that the sanctions that have led to some inefficiencies so far have actually not really come into force yet. So the, the oil embargo that the EU has put in place on Russian oil and crude oil and oil products is actually only coming into force in December for crude and in the early parts of February for products. Uh, so uh, there is actually a good reason to believe uh, that uh, there could be uh, even stronger rates uh, ahead in, in the first part of 2023. But all of that, of course, is highly uncertain. Coming to the my last slides here. Uh, so the guidance for the full year, uh, a record breaking uh, year we're looking into with a net profit of between 560 and 640 million dollars based on continued strength in the product tanker market. Uh, and a very high cover in the, in the dry cargo. <clears throat> so overall, a profit of $179 million in the quarter, which is really a fantastic result in just uh, one quarter, um, driven to a large extent by this shift that we did uh, away from dry cargo into product tankers, because we felt that the risk reward uh, of changing our portfolio was much more attractive over in the product tanker space. Uh, we are well positioned still to capitalize uh, on uh, the rate developments in, uh, in dry cargo uh, and we are well positioned to capitalize on the improvement and the continued strength in dry cargo. Uh, uh, and as I've said before, an NAV of uh, 377 kronos per share in our asset unit uh, and spoiling shareholders, I hope a little bit, with an interim dividend of 30 kronos per share and a share buyback of uh, $40 million. And of course, uh, I have to say that there are some forward looking statements here uh, that uh, you should be careful of. And uh, that then concludes my presentation. I think I will hand back uh, to you, Rasmus. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for running through the uh, for the second quarter results here. Um, there was one overall question I had sort of, um, as you stated uh, on one of the previous slides, you really had a fantastic quarter. We can almost call it a, a home run, I guess, uh, the, what we're looking into this year and what you are achieving. Sort of, I know it's hard to separate these things, but you, could you give an indication or what feeling you have on how much can be sort of um, benefiting from sort of this change you did in strategy some years ago and your business model? 
and how much is sort of to sort of the, the general uh, market development or, or perhaps the change in strategy gave you extra um, uh, possible uh, possibilities to benefit on this upturn. Could you put some mm. words on that, please? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, but it's also a very tough one to answer with, uh, with real facts. Uh, I think certainly the old business model would also have made a lot of money in the dry cargo market that we uh, are in or that we have just been in uh, and also in the current product tanker market. I think the, the key for us is the, uh, the capital discipline uh, and the ability to act on that that we have instilled uh, in the business model. And by that, I mean uh, that uh, because we are very active in managing our risks, Sometimes we will earn a little bit less maybe than our peers, but we will also use a lot less capital. So we are convinced that this new model that we have built uh, over time will demonstrate higher, as we call it, risk-adjusted returns, which basically means how much return are you getting for the risk and the capital that you need to employ. Uh, and I think uh, the swing that we did this spring, uh, where, we, where we reduced the amount of capital employed in dry cargo and reinvested, if you could say, over in tankers, uh, is one of the new things that we couldn't do with the same scale before. Uh, and, uh, and I think this, this is not something where one quarter demonstrate that, uh, that this is perfect, uh, but it certainly, I think, builds on our track record that this is something that we can do. Uh, and it's something that also for the uh, investor with a little bit longer horizon, I think is quite attractive because it makes it, it, makes it uh, less important for the indiv individual investor to decide whether they like dry cargo or product tankers, uh, because they can rely on us actually to uh, to make some of those uh, decisions. Uh, so I'm convinced that over time we will be able to demonstrate that uh, this model that we have now uh, will lead to uh, to uh, higher returns on a risk-adjusted basis. Very good, thank you. And a follow up on that, um, just to get an understanding: How agile are you in changing direction? Say. If you had mess with, for, for instance, the product tanker market and the rates didn't go up to the extent that you had expected, how quickly can you change sort of your directions in, 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 these, um, in these bets? Yeah, we actually had a situation in the beginning of 2021 where we were too negative on the outlook for dry in Q1 2021. Uh, we've talked about this, uh, I think, on previous occasions. And so we actually came in uh, during that quarter a little bit on the wrong foot. Uh, but when we saw that the market developed differently from what we had expected, uh, I think we actually demonstrated that we were very, very quick to turn around uh, and regroup and actually then build a very attractive position also in, in dry cargo. Uh, so I would say, uh, especially on dry, we can do this very, very quickly because the market is uh, very liquid. We have very many instruments at our disposal. Uh, and it's a little bit more complicated on the, on the product tanker side because the same tools are not available to the same extent. So I think in the, on the product tanker side, you have to be a little bit more patient and a little bit more focused on sort of not just the next month or two, uh, but on the coming, call it two, three quarters. Uh, but we can still do a lot. We, we did actually take in, uh, I think it was around 10 time charter ships uh, in the end of 21 and beginning of 22. Uh, so you can do a lot, uh, but uh, I think you will see us starting to take risk off in product tankers perhaps in, in good time before the peak, at least our view on it, uh, because it takes time to, uh, to uh, adjust that position. Very good, thank you. Um, and there's a few questions sort of relating back also to, um, to, to this, um, you have uh, on the order book um, that is currently, uh, it's currently very low on the uh, both on the uh, dry cargo and on the um, on the tanker side. There, there was a question relating to sort of um, how many ships you sold. I think you indicated that that was three uh, three ships. Three vessels, uh, yeah. yeah, three vessels. Um, and there was another one here that the, the the viewer here is indicating that ship prices has only moved up a little bit uh, despite uh, those huge increases we've seen in the rates. Is there sort of a lagging effect? Or are the market a little bit worried about, say, 23, 24 uh, mm -hmm. levels, so, so ship prices are not going up to the same extent? Yeah, so on the product tanker side, uh, I think it's correct to say that spot rates have exploded more than you have seen reflected in, in asset prices. And I think that is actually quite typical that people tend to you know, see explosions in spot rates as somewhat um, temporary. 
and to only build them into asset prices slowly. Uh, I do think now that we have seen several months of high spot rates in product tanker. So we are seeing now a significant effect on product tanker rates. Uh, and uh, after the uh, after the end of Q2, uh, they have uh, certainly uh, gone up further. Uh, of course, it's hard to say what is anticipated and what is built into the current prices. Uh, but I do think that uh, when you look at analyst reports for 2023, there are some very Verbal discussions about this effect of the oil embargo is really taking effect uh, and the upside, but it isn't really built into forward prices uh, to a full extent, at least. And of course, that is also because it is quite uncertain. Uh, so these oil embargoes could be changed. Um, but, uh, but I think overall, actually, that people are more positive than what is currently built in uh, to prices. That is my assessment. And a, and a question relating to this, that there's um, you asking here if the current guidance includes vessel sales in, in second half of uh, 22. So uh, our policy is to include the vessel sales that we have agreed, uh, but we do not try to forecast whether we will be able to make further vessel sales and further gains on that uh, uh, during uh, the, uh, the coming period. <clears throat> so only the known vessel sales are included. Good. And also, um, there's a viewer asking here, if the current fleet size is sort of limited by either capital or market opportunities. Um... Um, it's, it's interesting what has happened with uh, sh shipyards and ordering over the last couple of years. Our view really is that uh, you have seen a huge spike in container rates and that led Pre early on in the cycle to a lot of container ordering and throughout the upturn in dry and now the upturn in tankers it has uh, it has been it has looked as if it was more attractive for shipyards to take in container orders rather than take in dry cargo or product tanker orders so a large part of what is happening in our view at least is that now yards are preoccupied building container ships and there's actually a huge order book there they are also building LNG ships and so forth uh, but they have actually felt uh, it looks as though the margins on building our type of ships have been too low. Uh, so there's both a capacity constraint where the shipyard capacity has been used for uh, other segments. But I think also there has been a hesitancy with uh, owners to, uh, to invest um, a lot into new buildings when there is still a lot of pressure on the decarbonization agenda and a lot of uncertainty about what is sort of the ship of the future going to look like? Uh, so I think these are the forces that are actually affecting both the supply of yard capacity and the demand for, for new ships. Good. And also another uh, question relating this to, um, as if you are asking uh, here, if uh, could sort of this sort of some of these um, uh, transportations in the uh, in the product tanker market could they sort of be substituted by uh, larger tankers like the VLCCs <laughs> and the where rates is perhaps not at the same level or prices are not uh, going up as much as, as we've seen on other um, vessels? That's a very good question. Uh, and I think the, <clears throat> the answer to a large extent is no. Uh, so although normally we actually subscribe to the thesis that crude and product tanker markets are very well correlated because it's, it's the same product that they are transporting. There is actually a big difference. So very often what uh, what we do should be considered distribution of refined products uh, so the refinery takes in crude and it processes that crude into uh, gasoline diesel naphtha jet fuel and so forth which is then what we transport and typically such distribution is in smaller vessels because it goes into many more smaller ports uh, that can be draft restricted whereas the big crude ships especially the vlccs they basically go from the Arabian Gulf to Rotterdam maybe or out to China because it's really dependent on being on the big oceans and into the, only the big ports. So uh, we have seen over the last 12 months that VL rates have been lower than product tanker rates because the substitution doesn't really go that way. Uh, so, uh, so I think actually that uh, the product tanker rates can have this uh, strong market without being eroded uh, by, the, uh, by the crude tankers. Of course, the Aframaxes, which are the smaller crude tankers, they are in more head-to-head -head competition with the LR2s. Uh, and, uh, and there we see them being very uh, correlated, but they are already very high also. Uh, so we don't see a big threat from the VL rates. 
Uh, and we do also actually see that VL rates have come back up quite a lot in recent months. Uh, so it, uh, it is in our view positive now that the tanker market is starting to fire on, on all cylinders. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we are sort of running out of time, but just a, a few last uh, questions here. There was there's, there's was a question here. I think we had it before. Uh, I was also if you could uh, perhaps move into other shipping segments like uh, LNG or crude or, or LPG, the, the, the viewer is asking here. I think the model that the business model that we have uh, could actually also uh, incorporate other shipping segments. Uh, so it's not something I would rule out, but it's also something I would say it's not something that you should uh, expect us to do within sort of the next coming quarter or two. It's, that would be more of a long-term strategic decision. Uh, it's not where we are right now. Very good. And and could you also say for how long and, and, and uh, what part of the um, capacity in Product Tanker have you covered right now? So um, the product tanker exposure that we have is both in the asset uh, business unit and the freight services and trading uh, business unit. And in freight services and trading, uh, we are now, um, I would say, the majority of our capacity is running spot. Uh, and on the uh, assets uh, and uh, logistics side, I would say it's probably a little bit more than half uh, that, uh, that we have covered. Good. And one last question for you, Martin, here is, um, could you just give us an update on the situation around Russia and Ukraine? I guess yes. Russia is a uh, no-go uh, uh, for, for shipping and other parts of transport. But but how about Ukraine? Uh, we've seen that there's been some agreements on, on grain transports out of Ukraine. Could you just give an, a short update on that, please? Yeah. Yeah, I would actually correct you a little bit. Russia is actually not a no-go in general. Okay. The sanctions are not that wide reaching. But we have self-sanctioned and said we do not want to do business uh, with uh, that incorporates Russian ports or Russian entities. Uh, but some are actually still doing this. Uh, um, and with respect to Ukraine and, and the grain exports, uh, I would say we haven't added uh, new agreements to export uh, grain out of Ukraine. We are monitoring the situation very, very closely. It was a trade that we actually did a lot in the past and we did have a ship in there that has now been uh, released with grain uh, but uh, so far it's still very uncertain and i think the key uh, evaluation for us is really that we are sending human beings on the ships into a war zone so we have to be really comfortable that that is a safe thing to do we would very much like to actually help ukraine export its grain uh, but it has to be on a safe basis uh, for the crew very good. Thank you very much for updating on that. And uh, with that, we will uh, end today's presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, and to no one for um, for running through your uh, Q2 numbers uh, here and answering uh, all the questions. And thank you for those of you who uh, joined the presentation today and asked a lot of interesting questions. With that, I'll just uh, wish you a nice day and uh, and a nice weekend later. Thank you, and thank you for listening in.